I'm Mitch Cradle, retired homicide detective turned filmmaker here in Washington, D.C. April 6, 2003 is the day I was at home relaxing and I got a phone call from my sergeant. He told me we had a triple murder that just occurred at Colonel Brooks Tavern located in the Brooklyn section of Washington, D.C. I got myself together, I jumped in my vehicle, and I headed towards the city. While en route, I got another phone call and I was told that the manager was there and he survived the attack. Right after that, I called my friend Deborah, she's a prosecutor. We've been working together for years. I most definitely wanted her there just in case we needed anything. And I wanted her to be part of the case. She's the prosecutor I've always chose to work on my cases. So once I get there, it's so many people there. I talked to the first officer on the scene. I talked to my sergeant. And I just wanted to, just to find out what was going on. They told me where the manager was sitting. Before talking to that manager, I wanted to go inside the restaurant to see the crime scene. Therefore, I went inside and I saw officers standing near the walk-in freezer. I walk over there and looked in, shell casings all on the floor, blood everywhere. And it was just obvious that everything occurred right there. But I still walked around the rest of the restaurant just in case anything may have been left. Um, sometimes suspects leave things behind. And I just wanted to just to have a feel for the place before I go talk to the manager who most definitely is going to explain everything to me. So when I got back downstairs from the, the office part of the um, restaurant, someone gave me the identification cards of the victims because by the time I got there, the victims were gone. I had no idea who the victims were. So they gave me the three ID cards. I looked at the first one, Naomi Payne. I'm um, not familiar with her, but it's, it's sad that you know we're there and here it is, a young lady and, and you know, it's... it's Wow, sometimes you just have a different feeling when, when, when young ladies are murdered, young ladies, children, elderly. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's, just a, it's, it's terrible for anyone to be murdered, but, oh wow, I can't even begin to explain. But um, just to see her ID and knowing that she was one of the victims, it, it, it really, it, it, it sad me, it really did. The next ID was Joshua Greenberg. Looked at his ID, most definitely wasn't familiar with him. And again, here it is. I looked at his address. He wasn't even from that area. He come there to work. Hard working people are victims in this 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 murder case. It's just it's just horrible. So I finally looked at the third ID, and when I saw that third ID, my mind just like shut down. It's like the entire room just went blank, went dark. Um the third victim was a friend of mine who I've been knowing for years, late teenage, early adult years. And Rodney Barnes was one of the, the, the nicest guys you can ever meet. He would give you his last. Um, he, he didn't bother anyone. And I mean, oh wow. He was just someone who was always smiling. Um, we all, you know, grew up around Raymond Wreck, not too far from there. Um, with, with this murder occurred, but Rodney was just a, a, a great person and to see him as one of the victims just, just tore me apart. And I wanted to go to my sergeant and say, look, sergeant, I, I'm, I'm just too, I, I, can't, I can't do this, man. It's because, I mean, Rodney wasn't a street guy and I'm quite sure Josh, Naomi at a particular point, I didn't know them, but I knew they weren't like that as well. I mean, they're sitting there, they're hardworking people. And just to have Rodney as one of the victims, it, it really, it really bothered me. But I knew I couldn't go to Rodney's sisters. I knew I couldn't go to Tweety. I couldn't go to Jackie. Oh man, I couldn't go to his brothers. I just couldn't go to them and say, I can't investigate this case. There's no way in the world. And I did not want to see them until I knew I could make an arrest in this case because this wasn't personal, but this was just a case that would touch anyone. Three hard-working people come to work, and they're murdered at work. 
I went outside, introduced myself to the manager who was in a car with an officer. Um, he was he was in a bad state. He was crying. Um, I know he didn't want to talk to me at that particular time, but you know I just had to get a little information from him so I could do the on-scene investigation. Um, he briefed me slightly on what happened. I didn't want to go into everything because I knew I'd be talking to him again in my office. So I went back to the restaurant. I would talk to the evidence technician to let him know exactly what the manager told me about what went on here. So once I finished talking to those guys, I went back outside. We did some canvassing in the area, knocked on some doors. We walked around to see if anyone may have dropped anything. We, we traveled the, the, the flight direction that the manager said the, the suspects left just to see if we get anything. I mean, just it's just things you do. You want to cover all your bases. And we did, uh, uh, wow, we did a, a hell of a job with the cameras in that particular area. But um, at that particular time, no information was gathered at all. Once we finished doing that, we, we dealt with a few more things on the crime scene before it was time to go to the office to now deal with the manager. So I had the manager ride with me to my office. Now, this is a couple hours later, but still on crime scenes, you most definitely want to take your time before you rush out of there just in case you, you miss anything. Once we're downtown, got the manager inside of an interview room to make him comfortable because I knew right then and there was going to be a long day. He may not have known that, but I knew it was going to be a long day. We're talking about three victims, one survivor. It's going to be a very long day. And normally with establishments, um, when you talk about robberies, it's normally an inside job because people who are familiar with the places, those are going to be the ones who are going to be involved, whether they set it up or they may have been there. So those are some of the things I just wanted to get out of from the manager, just some of the history of the place. Um, and most definitely, first of all, let's have an extensive interview as far as what happened. So we talked about what happened and he told me the same thing over and over. I asked him the same thing, many different ways. And he kept telling me the same thing over and over. I don't care how many times I tried to switch things around to get information from him. He kept answering it the same way over and over. At that particular time, I still wasn't convinced that he wasn't involved. So we sort of put pressure on him. We picked up the pace. We put the heat on him, as you could say, and we could see what was bothering him. And I know he wasn't in the right state of mind to be dealing with what we were doing with him at that particular time, but we are there investigating a triple homicide. And we don't have time for people's feelings at that particular time. And we wanted to make sure that if he's a witness, he's a witness and he's not involved. So I know he was getting frustrated and I'm quite sure the pressure and just the things we did in talking to him, I'm quite sure with the mental state that he was already in, there's no doubt in my mind that it bothered him. I'm quite sure it, it, it would have bothered anyone. He was, he was with us from that time, police arrived on the scene, and to going on into the next, almost the next morning. And when the owner of the restaurant came there, he sort of saved him because um, we were not ready to let him go. With homicide cases, we, we, we thorough, um, we, we try to check things out, we just don't want to jump to conclusions, we don't, but we don't want to miss anything. So that's why he was there for so long. Um, and I know most definitely he didn't want to be there. And when he left that office, he was not in good shape. I could tell that we, we drove him. We drove him to that point that will probably stick with him forever. And it wasn't something that we'd done intentionally. We were just at that particular time, not sure if he was a suspect or a witness. So once we finished with the manager, we continued to just look over some of the employee records that the owner left for us. And before I get into more about the manager, um, I'm going to let you hear from him and then I will talk more about him. I was the first person there. And for some reason, I didn't want to go in the building by myself. So I was like, okay. 
So I waited on the, um, by the wall, um, going into the back door. Um, and as I waited, a Metro police officer came by, um, walking, and we waved good morning um, to each other. And then I, I can't remember, I think Josh was the first person to arrive um, to work. And then once he arrived, we went inside, we made coffee. Josh proceeded to tell me um, that he think he met the one, um, the one that he was gonna marry. And I said, I thought you met her last weekend. And he said, no, that wasn't the one. But this weekend, she's definitely the one. And so uh, my friend Lamar didn't know, but we was playing a huge surprise party for him that day. So Josh was gonna make crab cakes for me. And I told Josh I never baked crab cakes in the oven. Um, and he was like, it's gonna be really simple. And then I can't remember um, who came in next. It was Rodney or Naomi. Um, Naomi was gonna make like potato salad or something. And she was also gonna attend the party. And Josh, I'm sorry, Rodney had bought me a huge bottle of Grey Goose for the party as well. Um, so we all had coffee. We chatted and laughed. Um, everybody went to work. I proceeded to the office um, to count the, you know, go to manager sheets, anything from the night before, and then to count the proceeds from the night before to make sure the manager dropped what was supposed to be dropped. <clears throat> um, I got into the office, I opened the safe, I turned the radio on, which automatically turned on the gospel station, um, proceeded to open the safe, took the money out of the safe, and as I was taking the money out to say, as clear as you can hear my voice, something said, look. And I looked up and I saw the dudes walking in the door, pulling down mask, mask, like mask halfway down, but then it was pulled all the way down. I went into um, panic mode. So I threw the money that I had, all that I could back in the safe. Um, and I remember reaching for the phone, trying to dial 911, but I couldn't. I had a set of keys on the side of me, which had about 50 keys on it, um, because it was to every door. Um, I ran to the hallway, and there was a door to the rooftop. And on my very first try, I got the right key to open that door. I went on the rooftop, and I locked the door behind me. And I just kneeled, and I just began to pray. I was like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I just didn't know what to do. I was just in a stated panic. It seemed like forever that I was on the rooftop. And then I saw two, uh, two, two people, I think, come out the back door. And they looked back at the roof and it seemed like they looked directly at me. And when they looked at me, I said, it's now or never. So I opened the door, ran, ran in the downstairs and ran to the other building. Connor Brooks with two buildings. It was Connor Brooks and Alan Jones. I locked myself in the other building and I called 911 and I told them we had just been robbed. Um, and again, what seemed like forever, uh, they told me the police um, were outside. Could I come outside? And I said, absolutely not. I said, you guys have to come in. And they say, sir, we can't come in. You have to come to us. And I said, That's, that can't happen. You guys have to come in the building to get me. Um, and then they just kept telling me that I need to come to them. So I just ran, to, I opened the door and just ran um, to the police. Um, and then they say, we went inside and we're screaming, um, police and no one answered. I said, that's not possible. My coworkers are inside. Um, So we went and um, she took me in. Um, the officer took me inside with them and they were screaming police and no one answered. Um, and, um, she she um, opened the walk-in door and I saw them on the floor and I just fell to the floor screaming. So they had to take me outside. I remember them putting me in the front seat of my, of, of Jesus. I remember them putting me in the front seat of the police car and they um, were asking me my name and things like that. And I, I couldn't tell them my name or nothing like that. So I could, now I could hear her asking me, telling me that she's taking my wallet and that she's taking my ID. You know, she was just walking me through what she was doing so that she can identify me. 
um, from there, um, Mitch came on the scene, um, and they, um, like people were just coming from everywhere. They put me in to Mitch's car, if I remember correctly, um, Detective Mitch Cradle um, car, um, and we stayed there, still stayed there for like, seemed like hours. Um, and uh, on the way to the police station, I asked Mitch, um, um, where were my coworkers? And he said, um, I think he was trying to tell me they didn't make it, but when he see that, um, so when he saw that I wasn't comprehending, he said they were at the hospital. Um, so that, I guess even, you know, once we got there, um, they just began to question me, question me and talk about my, my background and my past and um, how, am I sure I didn't need money and, and, and stuff like that. So we took a break from the interrogation and then Rudy, um, my boss came in and uh, I asked Rudy, why was he there? Why was he at the hospital with, with my coworkers? And that's when Rudy told me that they were um, that they were gone. Again, I just collapsed in the middle of the police and just started screaming. Um, like I said in the beginning, they were very nice, but as the day went along, it became very aggressive, um, um, very like you want to confess. Um, how were you the only survivor? Um, did you have someone do this? And um, so it was a long process, and it wasn't a one-day process. I had to go to the FBI and take a polygraph, and they said I failed a polygraph. And I was like, you know, I remember one of the questions was, did one of the robbers look like you on the polygraph? And I was just so angry. It just made me angry. Um, when I when I wasn't crying, I was angry. So just angry. It changed my life is that I don't sleep at night. Um, uh, every sound. Um, when Colonel Brooks first happened, I had to go to a psychiatrist five days a week. Um, uh, every day of the week I had to go see a psychiatrist. I had a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Um, so I would leave one appointment and go to another appointment. Um, and in that process, he, one of my psychologists told me that going through trauma like this, it, there's a, another part of your brain that wakes up and you can control it, but you can never turn it off. So my sense of, if, it, if, it's, if you're walking behind me and you're not making a sound, I can feel you behind me. Um, so it, 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 I'm always alert, always. And um, um, so it made me a more cautious person, uh, I would say. As you can tell from the manager, he wasn't in good shape when he was in the office. And here it is years later, this case still bothers him. And I know just what happened, the things we, we did to him, uh, just, just what we took him through. And just this entire situation will probably be something that will bother him for the rest of his life. Um, despite all of that, me and him developed a great relationship um, with friends now. Um, I mean, I have a great deal of respect for him. I was with him through the entire process, dealing with trial, um, the grand jury process. I mean, just everything. We developed a great relationship with each other. And it was just unfortunate that we had to meet this way because he, he, he's, he's a great guy. And he understood we were just doing our job. And if it was his family member or anyone else's family member, we would have done the same thing because as a homicide detective, you have to be thorough. You just cannot let things go past you so easily. You have to investigate everything and you don't rule anything out until you're definite on the direction you're going and you have the people who you're trying to um, arrest in reference to your investigation. So I most definitely um, apologize to him after all of that and as I just stated, we're real good friends. Carlos, the manager, then told you what happened. Um, I talk about some of the things we did on the crime scene. In the next episode, I'm gonna talk about the investigation, how we caught the suspects. So stay tuned. Rodney was a fun-loving person. He loved everybody around him. He would do everything for anyone. He would give you the last dime in his pocket. 
He loved his son very much. We talk, me and my son talk about this every day. He has a granddaughter he would never get to see. And like the rest of them that's locked up, they get to see their family, their children, and their grandchildren. How much me and my son love him and cared about him. Now the investigation. For the first couple of months, all of April, all of May, and part of June, we didn't get anything. We interviewed a lot of the former employees, interviewed a lot of the current employees, and we still didn't get anything. No one had a piece of information that could help anyone. But we stayed on the case. We continued to just look at records. We continued to talk to neighbors. We continue to just, just look at other robberies in the D.C. area that could have been similar. Wow, we, we, we did so much for that first two and a half months or whatever it was, and we didn't get anything. So one day in June, I received a phone call from this young man. He sounded like he was a little disturbed on the telephone, like something was bothering him. And um, he asked for me. I acknowledged who I was. And um, he told me they had some information on the case. I most definitely wanted to meet him right away. I didn't even want to hear what he had to say. I wanted to meet him. And, but he was, it was just the way he was talking, um, not in a way that he wasn't sure, but just there was a concern in his voice. And I asked him, was he okay? He said, yeah, he was okay, but something was bothering him. I said, what's bothering you? I mean, is that, do it have something to do with this case? Now I'm thinking he may be involved and he want to just like turn himself in. But he said, you know, I know who committed the, the murders and it's, it's bothering me and I can't sleep, it's, it's heavy on my mind, I'm a Christian guy and this is, this is just tearing me apart. I need to talk to someone about this. So I said, well look, let's talk, let's get together, we can meet somewhere. And he said, no, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. Uh, he said, I'll call you back. And he just hung up the telephone. We didn't have the technology to trace the phone call, this, this old stuff, we didn't have anything back then. So what happens is um, I'm just waiting for this phone call to come back. But in the, in the time being, we're still doing the other things in reference to investigating the case. But the following month, I get the call again. I'm surprised he was able to get through because during that time period, our phones were all messed up in the office and a lot of phone calls we just were not receiving. But he called back, he got me, it was, that was just God sent. So we talked again, and he still sound the same, still sound concerned. And still, I'm not sure if this guy is involved or not, just how he sounds. And he said, um, now he wants to meet, he, he want to talk. So we selected a location where to meet, we got together, and I can still see that something is bothering him. So he went on to tell me that he knows the guy's involved. So I asked him who, and he gave me the names. He said, Tyree, Joel. Roderick and David. Some guys that he knew from back in the day as they were growing up in, in a certain neighborhood. So I was like, wow, well, how do you know they're involved? And he told me that um, the guy Tyree admitted to him that he was the one who shot the female victim, Naomi. And he told me that is what was bothering him because he knows Tyree and he knows Tyree is not going to shoot a female. Matter of fact, he said Tyree's not going to shoot anyone. And it was really bothering him. And when he said that Tyree told him that, he kept challenging him. But Tyree kept bragging about how he pumped rounds in her in the freezer. She was down on the ground. And he was just going on and on. So this was really bothering this young man. And I could tell it was, it was, it was, it was, it was heavy on his heart. It was real heavy on his heart. But he provided us information which gave us a great start. And um, we, we took him, you know, got an audio statement from him, make the most definitely record everything. And he said he cannot be a witness in this case at all. And I told him that if you're willing to help me with this investigation, I will not make you a witness in this case. I don't care what anyone else in the police department was saying. This guy, I'm building a relationship with him. 
And if he's able to give me enough information to move forward, him being a witness, that's something we're gonna we're gonna keep it that way. And we kept him away from everyone. We didn't tell our supervisor supervisors about him. We want to keep it all a secret. Of course, Deborah knew prosecutor. My guys I work with, Mike, Daryl, Big O, Corbett, you know, a lot of them guys, Big D Rich, all them dudes who I'm close to, Carlos, they knew what was going on. Because we all worked together over at the attorney's office. But we kept it close and we continued to work with him. And we was able to get information as far as everybody's last name. We now know who's who as far as where everyone's working, where everyone's going to school. Tyree is the son of a developer, um, no criminal record. Roderick, College student, no criminal record. And Joel, um, a government, a federal government employee, no record. Three good guys, but they're involved in this. So now we're looking into David. David' record is so pretty long. He's been in and out of prison. So now it's like he must be the mastermind behind all this. Then we find out he's a former employee of the restaurant. So now it's all coming together. Like I said earlier, most definitely someone who knows the place is involved. They're comfortable. They know when this occurred. They know when that occurred. They know when the money drops occur. So now, now, now we're on it, okay? Now, now we're on it. We got, we got everybody's name. We can locate the three good guys. But the one person we could not locate at any particular time was David. We had no idea where he was. So finally, a few months later, maybe around September, we were able to get a good address for where David was staying. So we went to the address, and when we got there, it was abandoned. Um, we went inside, looked around. I mean, it was just stuff all over the place. But I noticed a photograph on the floor. It's a photograph of a young kid, maybe 11, 12 years old. I looked at the photograph, and it was a kid I recognized. I was like, oh my God, and I just stopped putting it together. I know this kid and I seen his father before. It didn't dawn on me that the same David we're looking for is the father of a kid that I know from the Boys and Girls Club. And that's sort of, oh my God, that, that is just me not putting it together. Cause I don't really know the father and he wasn't a regular there. I just seen him a couple of times. So now I'm on it. But one thing I was not gonna do, I was not going to talk to this, this kid. He's 11, 12 years old. I wasn't going to involve him. I still see him on a regular basis at the Boys and Girls Club. I speak to him like it's nothing. Um, I didn't want him to know anything. I didn't want his mother to know anything. It's, I know who I'm looking for, so I did not have to include this young kid in my investigation. I was just feeling bad for him because I know what now we're about to do in reference to his father. And it's simple. Our goal is to charge his father with these murders. So as the investigation go on, we still can't locate David. We know where everyone is. So now we're at a brick wall. There's nothing else we can do in reference to finding additional witnesses because the guy who was told from Tyree about everything that went on, he don't want to be a witness and he's just an ear witness. I mean, he just was told what happened. So. I had a long talk with him and I told him that I most definitely um, will be getting back with him. We were talking on a regular basis, but I needed a little bit of separation just to put my head together to figure out what we're going to do. So as a group, we all talking. Um, we're talking about him. You know, do you think he will wear a wire or get a recording or things like that? So that's when we bring in Brad Garrett, FBI agent. Brad, good guy. He worked in a Starbucks case back in 1997. Real good guy. And we know he, you know, he has a lot of toys. Um, FBI always have a lot of toys. So we get with Brad, and you know, one of the suggestions that Brad um, came up with is that um, they had a vehicle, well, vehicles that they can wire up, and therefore we don't have to put a wire on anyone. He can sit inside the vehicle; everything's recorded, audio, video, everything. So I contact my guy. Yeah, he's my guy, man. We, we're real close. We, I mean, we, we built a great relationship. Almost talk like every day. I contact him um, and asked him, um, you know, would he help us with the investigation by going a little further than what he has already done? And he asked what? I asked him, would he mind having a conversation with Tyree, but we want to record it. 
And he was a little hesitant at first, um, but we assured him that it's, you know, he won't, he won't have to wear anything. He'd be inside of a vehicle, be wired up, video, all, everything. He was a little hesitant, but he agreed to do it. And, you know, we, we started things and we got, the, we got the ball rolling. So on the day that we had all this set up, um, Brad brings the vehicle. We meet downtown near um, police headquarters. And um, my guy, he meet us down there. And we, we, we're ready to roll. We got the my, my, um, team. We're going to follow the vehicle. Every, everything's in place. But what I didn't plan for or what I didn't ask, here it is, you know, I just didn't think. I mean, I'm just thinking everyone in D.C. have a driver's license. Um, my guy walks up to me and said, um, hey, um, I didn't tell you, but I don't have no driver's license. I'm like, oh, Lord. I said, well, can you drive, man? He said, yeah, I can drive. I just don't have a license. So I look at Brad. Brad turned his head. I mean, he like, man, all, you know, I don't got nothing to do with this. I'm like, look, man. Can you drive? He said, yeah, I can drive. So we said, all right, let's, let's do this. So we, we put things in place, put them in the vehicle. We followed him around. Yes, he can drive. He go to the McDonald's by Howard University up on Georgia Avenue. He picks his man up. They're inside the car. They're talking. They start traveling. Um, now Tyree wants my guy to take him somewhere. They're traveling across town. We're following. We're going across Florida Avenue. Tyree pulling out weed, start smoking. My guy can't even remember if he was smoking. I don't think he was smoking, but I think Tyree continued to smoke. My guy was driving. But if he was smoke, some, I wouldn't have been mad at him. He is, he's driving without a license. So smoking a joint ain't going to make things any worse. So while they're driving, now my guy is starting to talk to him about the case. And keep in mind, my guy is feeling bad for Tyree because he knows in his heart Tyree did not shoot this woman. But Tyree continued to brag. He continued to run his mouth. He continued to, to just boost himself up. And, um, you know, a lot of times guys, guys would do that. They would say they did things that they did not do. And at this particular point, as far as we're concerned, Tyree could be a shooter. I mean, it's, it's, you know, four guys involved. We don't know who the shooter is. So they, they go take the ride. He drops Tyree off. Everything's recorded. Tyree's talking about the entire case and everything. So now we got it recorded. My guy come back and, you know, we thanked him and everything. And, you know, he, he's still feeling bad because we're still in the same position where we um, were before. As far as him believing that his guy shot this woman, which is Naomi Payne. So now we still don't have an eyewitness to the case. All we have is an ear witness. So what we decided to do was now we're in... Um, now we're talking in December of 2003 when we're having this conversation as a team. We're going to charge Tyree with armed robbery. Okay? The plan is to charge Tyree with armed robbery. And once we get him arrested for the armed robbery, get him to confess and get him to give up everything. Let him tell us what happened. Now it takes my guy out of it completely if we get Tyree to flip. So everything's in motion. First thing we do... We get the arrest warrant for Tyree. We arrest him, bring him in. Now he's in, he's in the box. Um, my, my man Mike works him. Mike get a confession from him. And then we know everything that happened. The weekend this occurred, final full weekend is crowded in Colonel's Brooks. David Roderick is there casing the place out. A lot of people is there to see a lot of money being spent. Well, they thought it was a lot of money, but people using credit card, they think a lot of cash is being turned in. So that's why they went there that Sunday morning to rob it. And in doing so, Tyree and Joel are the lookouts. Roderick and David go inside the freezer. And what happens is they hear the gunshots inside the freezer. And Tyree find out later that Naomi recognized David. She knows David. He's a former employee there. And that's when David said, we have to kill him. And they killed all three inside the freezer, David and Roderick. Everyone leaves out. Everyone's gone. All they got is $3,000 from the restaurant. They divided $3,000 four ways, which is no money at all. So we end up now getting restaurants for everyone. We got Joel down at his job on M Street. 
Got Roderick out in Baltimore. My man D. Rich and Corbett went out there. My man Jeff handled uh, Jeff May. I think it was Jeff Mayberry and Carlos, I'm not sure. But they handled the um, M Street arrest. We got everybody in. Joel come in, he confessed. Roderick out in Baltimore being a hard head. Of course, that's, you know, you think he's smarter than everybody. He, he doesn't give us anything, but it, at this point, it doesn't matter. Now, we have no idea where David is. The next morning, after all of this, David must have got, I guess, from the news that now we done locked up Joel, we done locked up Tyree, now we done locked up Roderick. So now David is, is gone. So we get information that he's down in Colonial Beach, Virginia. We jump into the car, um, butchering them, jump into the, the war squad, people jump into the helicopter. We all flying down Colonial Beach, Virginia, which is just south of Richmond. We get down there, and of course, they arrive before we do. But when we get down there, they're like, he's dead. And I'm like, what? I say, yeah, he's dead. He committed suicide. I'm like, whoa. First thing that came to my mind was just the picture of his son. Here it is, he just committed a triple murder, and he just committed suicide. So I said, where, where, where is he? He said, he's upstairs. So I went upstairs to the bathroom, and there, in the tub, was his body in a pool of blood. And it was, oh wow, I mean, he talking from April the 6th, 2003, until January 2004, we finally, um, Brought the case to to close to closure and after that trial process went on um guys found guilty played guilty found guilty uh, it just um didn't seem the same because david the mastermind was not sitting there and those three guys the college student the government employee the, the young developer were the ones that took the heat for something that someone else brought them into and that's how um, we closed the case. In January 2008, one morning I received a phone call from my sergeant and he told me that we had four juvenile victims found inside of a home in Southeast. And he also mentioned that the mother was on the scene. Right away I got with my partner, Darrell Richmond. We went to the vehicle. While on route, we saw Detective Jeff Williams and we headed over to the crime scene. While on route, um, there was a discussion between us on exactly who was going to handle the case. For my squad, I was up for the next case, um, being in the major case, cold case unit. But then we had another unit that handled baby deaths and murders involving young people. So once we got on the scene, it was just chaotic. I mean, police was everywhere, people, the mayor, the chief of police. I saw a lot of people going in and out of the house. And right there, I was like, that's, that's a complete no-no, that's a crime scene. But I guess everyone wanted to see the bodies or see what's going on. And I saw United States Marshals, a lot of their officers were there as well. So I went to our commander. I said, Commander, who case is this going to be? And he was hesitant. And, you know, I mentioned to him that, you know, I had Daryl Richmond, I had Jeff Williams with me. I mean, you know, we, you know, I could say those heavy hitters. And he looked at me and he said, You got it. I said, Cool. So right away, I went to the house. I said, everyone out the house. The only people who should be in this house is the mobile crime technicians. Okay, I think crime scene search was there from the nearby 7th district, but this case is gonna be handled by mobile crime. Okay, so once we got the house clear, Darrell Richmond, you, this is you, this is your baby, you do the scene. So Darrell Richmond is gonna process the scene from our office, and mobile crime is gonna handle things from their perspective. Now, Jeff Williams, I want him to handle the, 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 the mother. So immediately we find out that the mother has been transported to um, the Violent Crime Branch over on Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where our homicide unit, um, that's where they work. And that was another no-no because the case was gonna be handled downtown by either my office or the baby death squad office. So 
while we started the on-scene investigation, the first thing I did was I had the police officers from the 7th District to move the yellow tape to both ends of the block. I mean, everyone, including the mayor, chief of police, I want everyone behind the yellow tape at both ends of the block. In training, I was told that if you're the homicide, you're, if you're the lead homicide detective on a scene, you're like the chief of police. I wasn't trying to be arrogant. I wasn't trying to, to throw shade at anyone. I wasn't trying to be bossy. We need an order on that scene. I've seen situations when there's no order, there's problems. So I immediately asked everybody to get back behind the old tape. The mayor went, the chief went, everyone else went. On the scene, the marshal service, they stayed. I needed to talk to them, find out why they were there. The, some of the officers stayed to help protect the you know, inside area where we were right there in front of the house. And I just wanted to make sure that we were not going to make any mistakes on this crime scene. I talked to the marshal service. Oh, wow. Um, one of the guys explained to me how they went there for a normal eviction. And when they got to the house, the mother, Benita Jacks, would not allow them inside the house. So they had to force their way inside. Once they got inside, they said they smelled like foul meat. They had no idea where the smell came from. They said the smell was so strong. So when one of the marshals started to go up the stairs, Benita Jacks blocked them from doing that. She was not going to allow them to go up the stairs. There's nothing downstairs, no furniture, there's nothing. So they wanted to go upstairs to see if there was anyone else in the house. So they had to move her out the way, forcefully. They went up the stairs. As soon as they got up to the top of the stairs, there's a room right in front of it. They walk in there, boom. It just disturbed them. They saw three young victims lying unconsciously on the floor. Their bodies, their decomposition state, and it just tore the marshals up. They opened the door, right the room right beside it. They opened that door. It was surrounded by duct tape. They pushed that door open. They see another body lying on the floor. The state of that body was unbelievable. It was worse than how the other three looked. So it, it really disturbed them. They, you know, a couple of them stayed upstairs. Some of them went back downstairs. Um, I was told one had to go outside. He, you know, just... Man, he threw up, he just couldn't handle it. It was just so much, and the smell was so strong. So we got all the marshals together. We had them go down to our office so we could take statements from them in reference to what happened, what they saw, I mean, just everything. So now while I'm there on the scene with Detective Richmond and the mobile crime technicians, now it was time for me to go in and take a look around. As I stated, downstairs, first floor, completely empty, no furniture, nowhere. I mean, the kitchen was just... Disarray, I mean, just trash all over the place. You would think it's an abandoned house. Most definitely no condition for any children to be living in. I go up to the stairs. As I start walking up the steps, slowly, I could just smell what the marshals were describing. The smell was just so strong. The smell of decomp, as we would say in homicide. I get to the top of the stairs, and I walk towards the room where the marshals first went into. Now I'm gonna describe, no matter of fact, I'm not going to describe what I saw. I'm gonna let you see what I saw. So if you're not prepared to handle what I'm about to show you, just cut the video off or just stop looking, get away and just listen for a few seconds or whatever. So I walk into the room and this is what I see. Asia Fogel, age five. Nakaya. Fogel, age six. Tatiana Jacks, age 11. These babies lying on the floor beside each other. And once I left that room, now it's time to go into the other room. The room was like right beside, three bedroom, three bedroom um, house. The room right beside it, which I mentioned duct tape is surrounding the room. I walk inside this room. As I stated a few seconds ago, if you're not prepared to see this, please stop looking and just listen. I walk into this room and this is what I see. 
Brittany Jacks, age 17. And you see her body is in worse state than her three younger sisters. So that tells me right there that more than likely this occurred first. Now, that is what the marshal saw, that is what we saw, that's what we had to deal with. Now it was time for me to let Richmond do his thing here, let the mobile crime technicians do what they have to do here. Now it was time for me to head downtown to get with Detective Williams and we're gonna deal with Benita Jax. Now when I get downtown, now it's time to deal with Benita Jax. But before I even got there, some of the mobile crime technicians, they had went down there, they took the, you know, clothing from her that she had on, that's part of evidence, and they gave her what we call this, this, this jumpsuit for her to put on. Jeff Williams is there, um, he handled everything for me, he told me no one talked to her, which is, is, is major. You don't want a whole bunch of people going in and out of an interrogation room to talk to you know, your, your potential suspect or even witnesses. You just, you just don't want that. Um, the less people, the better. So me and Jeff Williams, we discussed a few things um, before I went in there. I didn't go inside the room and I uh, introduced myself to her Told her I'll be the one handling the case. She's quiet, not saying much. Um, asked her was she hungry. She told me she was hungry. Asked whether she wanted to eat. I would've got her anything, but she said she wanted McDonald's. She gave her order, um, and I told her I'll be right back. So I let her sit there. Jeff Williams was still there with her outside the room. I walked to McDonald's, and I needed that walk to McDonald's just to get myself together for this particular interview. I just wanted to get a feel from how she was, you know, when I met her and while I'm walking to McDonald's, now I can, you know, get my thoughts together on how we're gonna approach her. Because 9.5 times out of 10, situations like this, the first thing that comes to your mind is that something is wrong with the parent. Something is wrong with the mental state of the parent. First of all, just to be in the house for so long with the children, and if she murdered the children, something most definitely could be wrong. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind. But I don't know any of this because there are some situations where that's not the case, okay? So I know everybody is, is, is always thinking of mental health and um, the, 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 the suspect is a victim as well and, and things like that. But please keep in mind, we have four murdered children, okay? That's who we are working for. Four murdered children. I go to McDonald's, I get the food, come back, I give her food. I told her to take her time to eat it, there's no rush, because we're, we're gonna be there for a while. Once I give her food, I leave out, watch her on the monitor, she's eating very slowly, she's taking the time. I mean, it's just, this was different. This was not your usual interrogation. This was not the, 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 the drug boy, the corner boy, the, 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 the suspect who killed somebody during a fight. The, the, it, it was none of that. This is a mother who more than likely either murdered her four children or is part of what happened to her four children. We're, just so much was going on through my mind at this particular time. It was just something I had to um, get myself ready for. So instead of me just going over everything that went on detail by detail, because there's no way where I can cover everything in this, this video, I'm gonna let you hear from the mother in reference to some of the things that she said during this interrogation. Now you said that kids didn't wake up. No. Right? Down. One after the other. Huh? One after the other. One after the other. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. Okay, which one didn't wake up first? The little one. The little one uh, didn't wake up at first. Okay. Then... The next to the who? youngest. The next to the youngest. Mm -hmm. How much time passed by before the little one didn't wake up to the one next to the youngest didn't wake up. Okay, wait a minute, what are you saying? Right. When you 
you saying that they didn't wake up? It was one night and then the next night. Okay. Two days later and then the next one. Okay. One night, the littlest one don't wake up. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the next morning, I didn't know until the morning. Okay, you didn't know until the morning. Morning time, the little one don't wake up. Mm -hmm. What's the little one's name? Asia. Asia. Asia, okay. Asia don't wake up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two nights passes, then who? No. The next night. The next night. We go to sleep. We go to sleep. Wake up. Nakaya. Nakaya don't wake up. Yeah. Okay. Two nights pass. Two nights pass. And then we go to sleep in the next morning. Tatiana doesn't wake up. Okay. Tatiana. Tatiana. Uh. Okay, she don't wake up. Okay. Then, how long after this? I'm not sure how long. Mm -hmm. It was before the oldest one. I'm not sure. You're not sure? Mm -hmm. But the oldest one, Brittany, was the last one mm -hmm. to not to wake up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what did you think happened to her? Like I was telling them, I, I didn't understand exactly what happened. I was thinking about it, and it just didn't make any sense to me. Now, during this interrogation, she started talking about demons. She started talking about Brittany being Jezebel.
Medical examiners who examined the bodies determined that the three young girls had been strangled and that Brittany had been stabbed repeatedly. But due to the body's high level of decomposition, the examiners were unable to definitely attribute these injuries as causing the girls' deaths. According to Benita Jacks, all four of her daughters had died in their sleep, although she had made unsuccessful attempts to revive them. Once she had that information, was able to charge Benita Jacks with the murders of her four daughters. And during the course of the investigation, as it continued, we found out so much about her situation, what went on. I mean, it was just so much. And here are some of the things that we found out even before it went to trial. Brittany Jack's boyfriend provided information that the last time he saw Brittany was in March of 2007 after she had been absent from school for about a month. He stated during that visit she seemed very sad. He stated after that brief visit that Brittany stopped responding to his calls as well as messages on her MySpace account. In April and May of 2007, Brittany Jack's social worker Kathleen Lopes made repeated attempts to verify Brittany's safety. At the time, Ms. Lopes was an employee at Booker T. Washington Charter School in which Brittany attended. On April the 27th of 2007, Ms. Lopes visited the Jacks' home with a police officer and another employee, but Benita Jacks refused to allow them inside. Lopes provided information that she saw the two young girls in the living room and they appeared to be unkept. Over the next few days, Ms. Lopes made repeated calls to CFSA as well as to the police. As a result of Ms. Lopes' call, Police Sergeant Jane LaFranchise visited Jacks' home on April 30th, 2007 and interviewed Benita Jackson in her front yard. Sergeant LaFranchise stated that on his visit, he saw the three younger girls. They looked well fed, they were healthy, and they were playful. On May the 10th, Ms. Lopes wrote a letter to the Youth Social Service Division of D.C. Superior Court expressing her fear that Brittany Jacks was being held hostage. Social workers did not investigate. You got horns like devils and your teeth in me. You're on a whole nother level. Things you do to me. You got a hard blade of metal, lover and an enemy. Baby, you never try to change me. Oh, Ooh, you bleed black when it feels right. Ooh, hey, I don't gotta think twice. Ooh, so long that it feels right. Just what 